very ch chilly morning to Summit Seashore Birding Adventures uh, and part three of the Big Year Challenge. I'm actually down at um, Southampton Docks at the moment looking at an Iceland gull, uh, which is uh, a very nice bird, but of course this wasn't a part of the, the 2022 Big Year Challenge. Um, we are now in February uh, 2023. The thing about a big year challenge and being a birder rather than a photographer is that a lot of the birds that I'm showing you in these presentations only represent a small percentage of actually the birds that I see because I'm not always in the position to take photographs of everything. But I thought I'd pause before we get into our autumn birds um, and um, just sort of go through the equipment with you that I've been using during this big year campaign. So first of all, uh, binoculars, these are 1032 ELs by Swarovski. Uh, for those who, of you who aren't familiar, um, basically that means 10 means the magnification, so that means the subject is 10 times closer, and the 32 is in reference to the objective lens, which is 32mm. Basically, the bigger the objective lens, the more light it'll let in. So if I was spending lots of time in forest or in jungle for example I'd probably want something like a 742 because I'd have a wider field of view um, and but I would have a, a bigger objective lens which allow allows more lighting. My scope is a 25 to 50 uh, Swarovski scope uh, mounted on a Manfrotto um, tripod it's quite small and light and it works really well for my birding. A lot of the video uh, that you see of birds in, in this presentation is actually used um, in conjunction with my iPhone. I basically use my iPhone uh, in an adapter uh, and this simply goes onto the back of my scope and uh, I'm able to get uh, video footage. It works really well for static birds and um, slow moving birds but it's not very good for birds in flight. My camera is a Panasonic point and shoot bridge camera. I've always used bridge cameras and um, they're, they're very light and uh, convenient and um, you know easily just clipped onto the, the side of my backpack. Um, and then when the, opportun the opportunity arises for a photograph, uh, they're right there. Uh, the other piece of equipment that I've been using recently is um, my uh, shotgun style um, mic which I use for recording bird song. This I use in conjunction with um, a digital recorder. And lastly, really resources. Um, I'd like to sort of quickly go over them with you but we'll wait until we get home and I can show you them on the computer. Okay, I'm back at home now. Uh, let's just go through these resources and apps. Here we have Collins Bird Guide. This is the third edition, pretty much the Bible for most British birders. Uh, I normally have one copy in the car. This one sits at home, but also I have the app on my phone, which is great if you're out in the field and you've come across a um, difficult species and you want to confirm plumage or field marks, etc. Um, it's really good to uh, have this on your phone. It also gives you, on some of these birds, it gives you range maps and um, sort of a little bit of a write-up about them and uh, also it has some audio on it as well. So it's a really, really great uh, thing to have uh, to hand uh, when you're out in the field. Um, if you want to know what's going on around the country uh, there are two great companies uh, one is rare bird alert where you can uh, see sort of minute to minute what's happening uh, as same as with um, bird guides um, for example we'll just pull up uh, we do a search on Iceland gull that was the gull I saw uh, on Sunday um, so that was yesterday so if we scroll down um, here we go so this was yesterday 927 yeah that's exactly when we were there 
um, showing the bird. So uh, that's a must have really to see what's happening um, around the country. And then finally eBird. Now this is um, who I submit all of my records to. It's a fantastic uh, citizen science project run by the Cornell Lab for Ornithology. Um, I'll probably do a tutorial on this at some point, but um, uh, wherever, whenever I go birding, whether it be a twitch or if I'm going to a reserve or local patch, or even if I've sort of been out and about and I've seen an interesting bird, I report it um, to eBird. And then we'll just have a quick look here. Um, this is from yesterday with the Iceland gull. So I've listed a few of the species that were that I noticed while I was on that twitch, and then it give, gives you how many species you've seen, the protocol, uh, number of observers, which is brilliant if you're birding with someone who is also an e-birder. Uh, duration is 87 minutes, and it gives you. We just click on that. It gives you your route um, and how far you walked. And I'll just jump across to the main screen now and show you uh, what it looks like on a desktop. This is the home page. And as, um, as tempting as it may be to <laughs> navigate through some of these really cool functions here, I'm going to resist the urge and try and stay on track here. Uh, this is, will be your own page. If when you sign up, you'll get my page or my eBird, and um, this I just love it. It's um, all of my everything that I need is at my fingertips and is all consolidated in one spot. I've got my audio, I've got my photos, I've got all of my checklists, and what's really a really nice function here is trip reports. It allows you to set up trip reports so for example let's go to Gambia um, this is a trip report that I set up so on the left hand side is my actual write-up um, here this wonderful map shows all the places that I visited uh, when I was on my trip uh, species observed how many lifers I got on that trip um, you know the checklists that, that were submitted so we can just scroll down um, let's see let's just click on one um, yeah so when I was out there I had to do this I didn't do this through the app I did this afterwards and uh, through recording times in my notebook but there was two of us traveling it was roughly an hour and a half we walked basically around about a, a kilometre and uh, I've got my numbers down here and then obviously added um, you can add photos um, at a later date because that's the thing with the app you can um, submit all your records but you can't submit photos or audio uh, so that's done when you get home so quite simply um, I click on we link to uh, where we were down looking at the Iceland Gull. So it's um, bro broken it down into, it always gives you the county, the date, the time that you started. Um, there was two of us traveling. We were there for an hour and a half. Walked about 0.63 miles. This is the map I showed you on the phone. Uh, a little bit more detail. So we parked here, walked down, and we were viewing the bird, which was on some mud flats and out here. But it's really nice to have these maps <coughs> afterwards. It was a, a lovely reference. And then I put these photos in afterwards um, and also wrote some notes. Um, if you, you see, you can do that, you see, you can manage media, so you can add your photos there or your audio and edit species. So, for example, if you, uh, I don't know, you saw three mute swans, you can change that to three and save it, 
or if you know you accidentally put down that you saw an ivory doll um, then you need to delete that unless you actually did um, and then you can also add um, you can add details so you can put um, down some breeding codes or you can make notes on those particular birds uh, that you remember after the fact and save all that and let's just take you back to my eBird so that's it it's a it's a, a fantastic site it's really seamless and tidy everything is consolidated for me which I love and at the same time you're contributing to a fantastic citizen science project you know educators and um, ornithologists and biologists use this data to you know look at population trends and how birds are moving around and you know are they using different staging posts and you know is their you know range expanding or is it contracting um, and of course then they can implement um, conservation me measures to help these birds so it's not only a really fantastic way of archiving your records and it, you are at the same time contributing which for me is a is a win-win okay let's get into some of these autumn birds now first up this is red-necked phalarope down at pet level in east sussex uh, quite an interesting group the phalaropes for a few different reasons uh, once they're finish breeding up in the high arctic they become mainly pelagic meaning that they spend uh, all of their time out at sea uh, they have a very unusual feeding technique uh, where they spin around circles and create like a whirlpool in which they're able to glean food particles that come up into it they have a very unusual sexual dimorphism in that the female is larger and more brightly coloured than the male. And actually, once they're up on their breeding grounds and um, the eggs have been laid, the female plays no more part in incubation or raising of the young. That is solely down to the male. Uh, and in fact, uh, these birds um, unusually um, often engage in um, polyandry, uh, which is where females uh, take multiple male partners. Uh, a great example of this is actually our own Eurasian dotterel that um, often breed on the high mountain tops in Scotland. Um, there has been records of females breeding with males there and then moving um, north east up into Scandinavia where they have taken on um, another uh, t uh, one or two males. Um, <clears throat> next up here is Rhinec. Uh, Rhinecs are a member of the woodpecker family. This is down at Church Norton in West Sussex. Uh, they, you know, breed in mainland Europe, but unfortunately now uh, are extinct, extinct as regular breeders here in the UK, uh, but are annual on passage. Uh, here, this is a um, a photo of a Rhinec that I took down in um, uh, Icklesham uh, during the um, 90s. I was a, a ringer down there and um, was closing the next one day and I could see um, this bird up in the net and uh, quickly ran along to um, extract it. And uh, it turned out to be a wryneck, which was a, uh, a lovely surprise. Uh, here we have Black Tern. This is at French and Ponds in Surrey. Uh, small populations of these breeding in France and Spain and Germany and Eastern Europe. Uh, and they are fairly regular on uh, migration. Uh, Citrine Wagtail at Lodmore RSPB in uh, Dorset was a wonderful bird to see. Rare but increasing annually. Um, and now uh, seem to have a they seem to be moving um, as breeding birds further west and actually breed in Poland now. Uh, and they normally winter in Southeast Asia. Now, next came, comes a uh, North American Mega. And when this bird um, came up on Rare Bird Light, I knew I had no time uh, to wait around um, and had to get and twitch this bird straight away. 
On arrival at Wantage um, in Oxfordshire, was greeted by the avian paparazzi that were all ready lined up to see this sleeping bird. And of course it was this wonderful um, common nighthawk. Uh, a bird that I used to see on Vancouver Island. And, um, you know, its, to its arrival time was pretty much, in mid-island, was pretty much around the 7th of June. Um, each year. Here we have some um, pink footed geese. Uh, these are uh, probable visitors from Iceland, Greenland, and Svalbard. Always lovely to see these and to hear this wonderful call um, echoing over your head. Lovely to see them feeding in the uh, fields here. Um, here we have <laughs> an incredible bird. This is Jack Snipe, um, and this was at the end of the East Bank in Norfolk. Um, these birds breed in northern Europe, um, but they are um, they are smaller than a common snipe and with a much much shorter bill and a, a stronger facial pattern. Um, they're quite secretive, and they're really renowned for this wonderful bouncing behavior um you know just seeing them going up and down like a sewing machine or a little clockwork toy it was uh fantastic to watch this bird on this wonderful day <laughs> we uh well i i bumped into yellow williams of uh spring watch an absolutely fantastic naturalist and presenter and a, a real gentleman um and he greeted uh greeted me really well um and uh I, I i asked him if he would sneak up on jacqueline and give her a surprise which he did and it uh it was wonderful um next comes a a bird that sometimes you get a bird that you really really want to see and for me rad's warbler is one of those birds i don't know why uh, but I do remember when I very first came back um, to England from Canada after being away for so many years and uh, watching Twitch as a very British obsession. And during that show, uh, Brett Richards, um, uh, a, a fantastic birder um, here in the UK, uh, mentioned this bird when he was out on the Isles of Scilly. Um, and for whatever reason... I just hooked onto that bird and I, I really wanted to see it. And when it turned up on Beachy Head, um, I was really, really excited. But to be honest, um, as I drove down there, I, you know, I thought, well, if I could just get a, like a few seconds look at this bird or, you know, that's what I was expecting. My expectations were really low, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I didn't expect to get killer views of this bird, but turned up at Beachy Head and walked out to the site and there was about five birders there and I was absolutely blown away um, that this bird was so close it was up on the brambles preening in beautiful sunlight and uh, it was truly one of the highlights of my whole big year to see this this wonderful rad's warbler equally uh, another bird turned up in Suffolk um, and uh, we made our way uh, down during the day and got there just before last light to see this wonderful alpine ascenta. A bird that I tried for actually in the Pyrenees of Spain and not got. And so um, it felt very, very nice to finally uh, see this bird. And uh, yeah, it was just fantastic views and a, and a wonderful bird to see. Uh, back to Norfolk now. Uh, this is Long Bill Dowager at Klein, Norfolk. It is a, a North American rarity, um, breeding up on the tundra, and um, very familiar with this bird out in Canada. Uh, but the last time I saw one, or the only one that I've actually seen in the UK, was at Key Haven and Pennington Marshes in Hampshire, and that was um, two thousand thirteen. Uh, staying in Norfolk and actually um, at the beach of the back of Clyde was this wonderful desert wheat ear, uh, which breeds um, from the Sahara through the Middle East and Mongolia and winters in, in Africa and uh, the Arabian Peninsula. 
Um, as you can see, it was a bit distant and a very windy day, but here are a couple of um, shots I got from a bird um, that I got down in Kent uh, about 10 years ago. Um, next, this is uh, Sabines or Sabine's gull, whichever way you want to pronounce it. This high arctic breeder is up here uh, in the UK and often uh, seen out at sea. Um, but this in, uh, individual was found uh, west of Folkestone in Kent and on arrival uh, there was a few birders there and um, they weren't re they didn't seem to be looking at anything so I thought well maybe the bird's not here at the moment and I asked one fella and he said oh yeah it's it's just there and it was literally behind the car one of the cars and it was so close um, it was ridiculous it did fly off and move a little further away but um yeah just got fantastic looks at this bird and uh, a great one to have uh, for the uk uh next came a bit of a, a long haul up to whitley bay in uh tyne and weir uh five and a half hour drive um, with an overnight stay uh put us on site and um headed down to whitley bay um uh, to see this bird which we got um, absolutely killer views of uh, they 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 tend to breed on the barren mountain slopes in the middle east and um, apparently they they nest in holes in riverbanks um, which is i found quite peculiar and uh, they winter in mainly in east africa but yeah what a what a great bird to see and whilst there i popped up to st mary's lighthouse did a bit of um, a sea watch there and managed to get common ida for the year. Uh, next we went down to Kent again, down to Fawness Point to twitch uh, so, uh, a couple of red rump swallows. Um, unfortunately dipped on them, um, though they had been there for a couple of days. Uh, we didn't get them, though I did get a great northern diver um, out at sea. But whilst I was there, I noticed a, a lot of wading birds um, down by the rock. So I got myself into a good position as the tide was pushing in. And managed to get this um, wonderful views of um, this, this fantastic bird, Purple Sandpiper. Um, it's a rare breeder here in the UK. Um, uh, but uh, the wind... Most of the wintering birds here are mainly from places like Iceland and Scandinavia. But uh, yeah, I just waited it out and just sat there quietly. And as the sea pushed in, it pushed the birds closer and closer and got some wonderful uh, looks at this uh, great little wader. Uh, with autumn, at the end of autumn comes um, more wildfowl. And um, down at Slimbridge, I've got some great views of these Buick swans. Uh, they uh, breed on the tundra near the Arctic Ocean and, and winter uh, in northwest Europe. Um, on arrival they are making this racket as you can hear in the background here and uh, they seem to be bickering and squabbling about something but I'm not sure what that was about. Staying with the wildfowl we've got some Russian white fronted geese um, they also breed on the tundra. Uh, I believe the birds that overwinter here in in England are generally from the north from the northeast. Um, whereas if you were sort of northwest Scotland or or in Ireland, then you'd probably be seeing birds that are, I believe slightly darker uh, from the Greenland population. Um, and to finish this autumn uh, period off uh we have uh, another north american rarity this is um spotted sandpiper a bird that i was familiar with out in um canada um and uh even here uh, you can see i had a a bird on a breeding bird survey here so he's an adult and uh this is the nest i found um I did actually chase this bird down at um, Titchwell, uh, a, a bird in breeding plumage, uh, but unfortunately dipped on that one. And so to my absolute surprise, um, when this turned up, I couldn't resist it. So 
uh, went out to see this this great bird. Okay, to finish off the autumn season, I got uh, three good ducks on the 27th of November. The first was a redhead smew at Ibrook Reservoir. Took quite a long time to get this bird and uh, it was at distance, so I apologise for the terrible video, but it was um, a real relief to get this bird after putting quite a lot of time into it. And um, at Rutland Water, was able to get a greater scorp and uh, these wonderful red crested potchard. So that left me on 256 for the year with December to go. So lots to look forward to.